been a member for a few months and has a love for God, has a love for his word. He's going to be preaching on the superiority of Jesus Christ as our high priesthood. And Mark has not only been an encouraging member here in the church, but he's been a blessing to me personally. He has a love for God, a love for God's word, and he has a love for souls. And when you're, when you're passionate about evangelism, it doesn't take much for someone to come alongside. And you just get really excited about seeing people come to know Christ as their Savior and having their lives changed by him. So I'm going to have Mark come. I'm going to pray for him. And then we're going to look at Hebrews 7 through 19 to 28 together. Father God, thank you so much for Mark. Would you fill him with your Holy Spirit? And may you guide him in his speech. May you open our hearts and open our eyes to hold wonderful things from your word. Satisfy us with your word and with your presence. May your presence be felt here. May we understand the truth that is taught in this text. May you draw us near to you. May we begin to see Christ in a new way. And may it motivate our hearts to godliness. May you fill us and feed us today with your word. Guide Mark as he preaches. And may he communicate your word clearly. Thank you for his time wrestling through this text. Now bear fruit. You have said your word will not return void. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. we got a lot of technology. A lot of technology up here that I'm not used to, so bear with me. I'm mic'd up here, and I got a PowerPoint thing, and I got a clock. <laughs> I see it. I'm kind of nearsighted, but I see it. Yes, old preacher said in the South, I'll preach at the drop of a hat, and I'll even drop the hat. <laughs> um, as we get ready here, before I do a little info commercial for Pastor, uh, uh, find Hebrews in your Bibles, please. Let's do it backwards. Start in Revelations and go this way now. Revelations, you come to a little book called Jude, the three little letters of John, two little letters of Peter, James, and then you'll come to the great book of Hebrews. You know, as pastors preaching, I'm getting, I feel like I'm on the Emmaus Road whenever I hear preaching and my heart is burning within me while they open to me the scriptures. That's the way it is in all Bible study. When you open God's word, so many things can happen on a given time. People's hearts are challenged. You see people come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. And that, that, that's encouraging. I got a clicker here, but... Oh, it did work. <laughs> October is Pastor's Appreciation Month. I'm not getting paid to say this. But remember your pastor. And I think the very book that he's preaching will be a challenge to him. My, my daughter, one of my daughter's favorite verses is in this chapter. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, there's two verses on pastors in, in Hebrews 13. And it keeps us from the drift. We need to submit to the, the biblical teachings of a shepherd of a local church. That will help us because the book of Hebrews was written... To, keep, to prevent this drift from happening, from going back into a system that cannot bring the salvation. Judaism is the sign points to something more fulfilling. All everything in Judaism points to Jesus Christ. Hebrews is that transition book. We need this book. And God bless us here. Pastor, I appreciate your, your passion for, for the word and souls as well. And the way we encourage our pastor is to submit to their leadership because we can be a joy to him if you keep on reading the Bible. He has some members that can be a grief. And we, we want to be of the other sort. We want to bring joy as well to his work because we will actually share. And I'm so glad that God puts you in the vineyard here in northern Iowa because there's plenty of souls around here for Jesus Christ. It's a big harvest field. And God puts you here, Pastor, to carry on for the Lord. <clears throat> So remember him in prayer and thanksgiving, his wife, Emily, as they carry this one to term. May God will bless here as well. Also those that labor here as well, uh, John and Melissa work with the youth. Thank God for those Sunday school teachers, nursing care workers, college kids that come up every week. We appreciate all that you do here. Uh, I've been blessed, just been here, just a member for eight months, but I've been really blessed at St. Ansgar Baptist Church. So with that, let's go. I 
thought I would do something different. I'd like to read this in unison. I thought if I could have you stand one more time and we'll read our text before we begin to open up and see what God has to say. Now I can't see you. <laughs> For the law made nothing perfect, but on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. It was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath, but this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantee of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest holy, innocent, unstained, separate from sinners, exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins, and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the old which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. You may be seated. That was very nice. Yes. Hebrews is no doubt, there's one thing, one overriding theme, is the superiority of Jesus Christ. You know, about a year, a year ago, it was right before Christmas, it was dark out, you know how early the, the days come in December. It's eight days before Christmas. I got home, I'm, un, I'm just unwinding. A man needs a time to just get home and unwind. I need to remember as a man though that my number one job is to be a husband and a father. But I like this time alone. And the doorbell rings. <laughs> and my wife would say something like this. You're the man of the house, you answer the door. I say to her, I'm the man of the house. I'll go answer the door. <laughs> but unknown to me, outside the door in the dark is a type A personality, high pressured salesman that I'm going to run into. Now, my wife knows that I can't even hang up on a, what's those called, those callers that call your house all the time? I'm on the phone talking to a telemarketer, and my wife is saying, hang up, hang up. I can't, I can't. I'm not that kind of personality. I, I'm probably the most easygoing guy in Adams. And I opened the door and I opened it up to see who I'm talking to, and that's all he needed because he weaseled in past me <laughs> with a box. He says, You got, get your vacuum cleaner out. I'm going to show you a demonstration. By the way, to ease my conscience, he says, I'll, You'll get a free gift. Okay. So he comes through my mud room, he's, he's through my kitchen, he found some carpet, he's, got, he's on his hands and knees that quick. He's assembling this beautiful, stainless steel Kirby vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and my wife and the kids are in the kitchen and they're just listening to me and the salesman. He says, go get your vacuum cleaners. Well, I have plenty of vacuum cleaners. I have an upright Hoover in my bath master bedroom. I have an Orwick that you can pick up with one finger. We have a shop vac in the garage. Okay, I have these little hand ones. The problem is that the, not the vacuum cleaners at the Goose and Home. It's getting the teenagers to use it more. <laughs> That's my problem. So I have you. He says, go get your vacuum cleaner. He said, now, go test it. And so I, I do a certain section of carpet. I go back and forth. Now he says, watch this. He takes the stainless steel, and I think it has a Hemi in it. <laughs> because mine, mine's like a Prius. You know, he has a Hummer. <laughs> mine is only like a 98 horsepower Prius. <laughs> and I do, I, I vacuum. 
okay, now watch this. You just got this all clean, don't you? I said, yeah. He takes that Kirby, he takes out a white circle paper, he throws it on the floor, he says, a couple of swipes, he dumps the dirt out, he says, what? <laughs> I thought my curb was clean. That, now, that's not a disgrace to Esther May now. She's a good house cleaner. <laughs> but that Kirby worked. I mean, here's a plastic pullover standing next to a Kirby. One is stainless steel, one is plastic, one performs better. You know, I can go on and on. One's a Hummer versus a Prius. <laughs> but I don't want to dish out $2,000 eight days before Christmas. I got a budget. I got to pick up uh, Christmas gifts for my kids. <sighs> How did I get this guy out of the house? <laughs> he finally left. He reduced the price to like a thousand, one point two thousand to one thousand. He tried to show me all the facets of the Kirby. That's quite a long transition to saying that if I could only be a Kirby salesman for Jesus Christ, I read the Book of Hebrews at every page, every chapter, every verse. Jesus Christ is the ultimate, the preeminent one. You cannot miss. There's probably no New Testament book designed by God to show the glory and the excellency of Jesus Christ than the book of Hebrews. Amen. We need it. Jesus Christ is the total answer. Once you realize that, that all you have in him and through him, why do you look for something else? Like the woman at the well. If you knew Jesus said who's talking to you, you'd ask of me. And out of your belly would flow rivers of living water. In other words, once you find Christ, your search is over. But you still drink continually at that refreshing well that he wants to give you through the word of God. Yes, Jesus Christ is the answer that we need. The book of Hebrews is simply a study of contrast. Better, you'll see the word better, more, greater in the Sometimes 25 times. There's a comparison going on. What's the comparison? The old system, the Old Testament, which was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Do you ever hear that little saying? The New Testament's in the Old Testament, but it's concealed. Yeah. But the what? The Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. That's, they're, they're, it's like a hand inside a glove. They go together. And if you... And the sad thing about it is that Judaism kept on practicing their Judaism. They did not see in Jesus Christ who walked among them that he was the, the word, became flesh, and he dwelt among us, and we saw that glory. But he came to his own. And the sad thing, it says in John 1, 11, he came to his own, but his own received him not. So Hebrews is basically written to the Hebrews to teach the Hebrews not to be Hebrews. <laughs> I learned that from my childhood pastor about 58 years ago, but to follow Jesus Christ. And that stuck with me all these years. Hebrews was written to the Hebrews not to be Hebrews. This letter, it's funny, if you get to the last chapter, he tells these believers, I just wrote to you in a word very briefly. I thought 13 chapters is brief. But he says, these believers are starting to defect. They wanted to go back into this system that they've been saved out of. And I started to put two and two together. Why would you defect? Why would you want to go back to the early principles of Judaism when you have Jesus Christ? I don't get it. And I thought, well, I started to put it on the timeline. A lot of persecuted under the reign of Nero was happening at this time. Intense persecution. I thought, well, that would cause some to deflect. And then I came across the footnote that I want to share with you, because I think you understand the book of Hebrews. Bear with me, because it's such funny print. But the general purpose of this letter is to preserve those to whom it was sent from the danger of apostasy. Their danger on this subject did not rise so much from persecution as from the circumstances which was fitted to attract them to the Jewish religion. The temple, it is supposed, and indeed it is evident, was still standing at this time. The morning and evening sacrifices were still offered. The splendid rites of that imposing religion was yet observed. The authority of the law was undisputed. Moses was the lawgiver sent from God, and no one doubted that the Jewish form of religion had been instituted by their fathers in conformity with the divine direction 
Their religion has been founded amidst remarkable manifestations of the deity in flames and smokes and in thunder. That's Mount Sinai. It's been communicated by the administration of angels. It had on its side in its favor all the venerableness and sanctions of the remote antiquity. It commanded itself by the pomp of, and the ritual and the splendor of their ceremonies. On the other hand, talking about the new Christian faith, on the other hand, the new form of religion had little or nothing of this to commend it. It was of recent origin. It was founded by the man of Nazareth, who had been trained up in their land, who had been a carpenter, who had no extraordinary advantages in education. Its rites were few and simple. It had no splendid temple services. It had none of the pomp and pageantry, the music and the beneficence of the ancient religion. It had no splendid array of priests and their gorgeous vestments. And it had not been imparted by the ministry of angels. Of all things, sorry Troy, fishermen were the ministers. <laughs> enjoyed your Sunday school presentation so much. I also saw his big fish. The fishermen were the ministers. And by the body of the nation, it was regarded as a schism, a heresy that enlisted its favor only the most humble and lowly of the people. In these circumstances, how natural was it for the enemies of the gospel in Judea to con contrast the two forms of religion? And how keenly would Christians feel it? I think that puts the book of Hebrews in its context. Here you are, born a Jew, and these Jewish people are resilient people. I mean, every time somebody tries to knock out Israel, Israel walks away with the holiday. <laughs> Look at Egypt, Pharaoh. Try to, what? Keep them in slaves. They celebrate Passover. The story of Esther. I mean, Persian Haman trying to kill them. Wipe them out. They celebrate what? Purim. Look at it in the Maccabee period. They try to overtake the temple, desecrate it, but the miracle of Hanukkah. On and on it goes. They get a holiday every time somebody tries to knock these people out. And of course, Hitler tried it in 1945. And three years later, they celebrate their independence in 1948. Interesting people. Sure, you'd be proud. And with this uncoupling war, 66, the Romans begin to encroach upon Jerusalem. A four year war. I had an interesting read the last couple of weeks. I picked up my Josephus. A first century historian, not a Christian, no. But he writes about this four year war. And I couldn't finish it. it, it it's good reading, but it shows how Jerusalem was wiped out and the temple, this temple that they loved so much, was destroyed. Yes. The book of the author of Hebrews says we need to break from this system, follow Christ. Yes, who are these Hebrews? They were, from what we can gather, they were Jewish believers, second generation. I mean, they, they, their church started very close after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I get this from the third chapter. I'm just giving you some review. It says here in chapter 2, you can follow along with me, chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift, drift, drift away from it. For since the message was declared by angels proved to be re reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received the just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect, notice the word neglect, not reject. There's a big difference between reject and neglect. Reject means you turn your back on it completely. No, these are Christians. But they, the word neglect means they grew careless. It's like receiving an inheritance a farm, 100 acres of land from your dad who died. And you just let it sit and go to weed. That's neglect. As a Christian, a believer in Jesus Christ, you've been given a deposit. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. What are you doing with that deposit? Are you neglecting it? You need, the gospel was not meant to be hoarded. We have to share it. The share of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It says here in Hebrews chapter 2 that these believers, it says here, 
such great salvation was declared at first by the Lord and was attested to us by those who heard. God bore us witness by signs and wonder. God gave those first generation Christians the ability to authenticate the message was real. God gave those apostles the ability to do a special gift. Are uh, they continue today? I say not, because the word of God is done. We have the greatest sign and wonder right here. There's nothing more powerful. As it says in here, the word of God is a what? It's quick, it's alive, and sharper than a two-edged sword. We have it right here, the word of God. Yes, they were second generation believers. They had a long, I believe that this book was written closer to 70 AD. They were being persecuted. I, I picked this up in chapter six, if you're following along. At one time, these people were taking the heat. Chapter six, I think verse 10, I'm gonna read to you. For God is not unjust to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints, as you still do. And we desire each of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope to the end, so that you be not sluggish. Yes, they were, they were persecuted. I get this from chapter 10. Now follow with me. Go to the 10th chapter of Hebrews. I get that from chapter 10. This shows some of the intense persecution that they were going through. Hebrews chapter 10, I'm going to read verse 32. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with suffering, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partners with those so treated, for you had compassions on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves have a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, he says, do not throw away your confidence. So this letter was written to Jewish because it's addressing everything in Judaism. And they were second generation believers. They were being persecuted. And the sad thing is they were beginning, beginning to drift. And I think our pastor has went into great detail to show you how this drift started. They grew neglectful. And pretty soon, what's the first thing that's thrown out the window? Pretty soon, you, you, you distance yourself from the Word of God, whether by daily yourself, taking up the Word. I like to listen to it on the way to work. I have like an hour of drive time every day. I try to utilize that hour by having Christian preachers preach at me on the radio. I need that daily exhortation. That radio ministry is really a good for those that are traveling to work. We need that. Also, there were baby Christians. Pastor preached on baby Christians that were still on the milk. They should have been teachers. One of the greatest things, one of the greatest things that you'll grow, honestly, is to get involved in the Great Commission. Go you therefore what? Teach all nations. Then you what? After they say, you want to see them follow through in believers' baptism. But that doesn't end there, the tank. You what? You continue to teach them all things what survive commanded you, and I'm with you to the end of the age. I find out from my years in the ministry, or just by being a worker, that the people that will not drift so quickly are those that are engaged in teaching somebody else. These are the ones that will become the stable ones in your church. Get involved in teaching somebody else. Paul always had mentors. He told Timothy, the things which I taught you, you commit to faithful men who are going to teach others also. Four generations of teaching the Word of God there. Teaching the Word of God. Teach the Word of God. There's always somebody you can find out there that can teach the Word of God. I knew somebody that drifted, that's dear to my heart. About 20 years ago, 20 years ago, she was on the worship team on Sunday night. She would sing the Christian songs. She was active in church about two or three times a week. Uh, she talked about going to Pensacola Christian College. She had all the literature. She was 17 and junior and going into her senior year. But that summer, she took a, a summer road trip of drift. She found an unsafe friend. They connected at high school. Before I knew it, they took a week and they headed out to the East Coast. She came back, I'm talking about my, my, one of my daughters, 
she came back differently. She changed custody. She left Austin and went to the cities. Then she fell in love with a Russian immigrant, a Jewish Orthodox Russian immigrant. The next time I saw her, half her Bible was gone. She did not believe in the New Testament. Where did she get that influence? Where did she get that? And then that relationship broke off and she went in a tailspin. And then she began to experiment with the Eastern religions and there's a lot of them out there. And then that wasn't enough. She drifted into the occult, tarot cards, astrology. And that wasn't enough. She started playing with pot, and that wasn't enough. Then she became a meth addict. Drift, drift, drift. Fifteen years, dad praying, looking down the driveway like the prodigal son, praying for his daughter. 2016, my dear mother passed away, but my daughter was too high, I think, to go to the funeral. I preached my mom's funeral, of course, and I gave her these copies of the funeral. And she really broke down and cried. She wanted to get right with God. She wanted to get. She, wanted, she was never baptized, so I, I thought, well, she, she still had some of the, you know, some of the addiction going on in her life. But she wanted to be baptized. So should I forbid baptism until she's totally clean? And I said no. So I baptized her in a lake, up by Brainerd, Minnesota, at a church camp, 2016. Still struggling with addictions. And then one day she said, Dad, come on down to my apartment. So Esther B. and I loaded up Selah and Shepherd. We drove to Minneapolis. That was an eerie experience by all means because a lot of her drug friends were there. But she wanted to have a bonfire, a bonfire to burn up some of her past. And so just like the book of Acts and the book of Ephesians, remember after they got saved, they burned their witchcraft books? Well, we had a fire in the backyard, and she threw some of her tarot cards in the fire, and some of her drug paraphernalia, if I said that right, I don't know. Some of that went in the fire, and I don't know what did, I think firecrackers, everything was, it was a crazy night. <laughs> oh, some she still was struggling. About a year and a half ago, before COVID broke out, I got a phone call from the Albert Lee Police Department. She was there, she was high on meth, but she wanted to be turned loose to me. She wanted to come to Dad's house. And so I drove from Adams to Albert Lee, and I picked my daughter up about 1 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the evening, took her home, and me and my Esther May got down on our hands and knees. She wanted to have just one more, one more smoke of pot, just one more time. We got down on her face like this, and Esther May over here, and we just, in her eyes, and she started to break. After about seven days, we had her pretty well dried out. And I said, you know, because you have so much freedom, you need somebody to control the freedom. You need Teen Challenge. And she agreed to it. But I had to work that day. And I said, okay, I'll go to Hormel, and at the end of the day, I'll pick you up, and I'll take you right to Teen Challenge. She ditched me a year and a half ago. I still pray for her. Well, I got a well, you know, God, God, God's timing. She's drifting, but God's good. I praise the Lord. I had a birthday hero in September. I said, happy birthday, Earth Father. You taught me that on the tombstone, the most important is not the date you came to Earth or left. It's the dash in the middle. Thanks for the pilgrim's progress and the purpose-driven life. Well, 20 years ago, that was very popular, the purpose-driven life. Most of all, like my smartphone? <laughs> Most of all, thank you for all the devotions and unconditional love. I'm writing a book, and I always remember, and I always remember to embrace my edges as the Rose of Sharon. I named her Sharon Rose, but she wants to change it because she says, Roses have thorns. I love you, Dad, with all my heart. That was just 10 days ago. Am I giving up on my daughter? No, she's drifting. What's going to bring her back? When God, I, I, I give her into God's hand. It happens. But for her case, I can, I can tell you many things that have come. But let's go on here. 
As we go back to Hebrews, why were these Hebrews drifting? You can see in the timeline, I have, I have two of them. 30 AD is when Jesus Christ probably died. Uh, give or take two years on this calendar. His death, burial, and resurrection. The church started, Pentecost, Jerusalem church. Something happened in uh, AD 54. Nero came to the throne of Rome. In about 64 AD, you can check me out, fact check me, about July 19, Nero set the city of Rome on fire. And who did he blame it for? Who was the scapegoat for the city of Rome to burn? All he wanted to do was do some building projects. He had to clear the old buildings out, so he set the city on fire. And they say some of the old history books that he played the fiddle while the city of Rome burned. And then he turned on the Christians to be the scapegoat. We believe in about this time period, 65 to 68, two great leaders of the church died. They were killed. Peter and Paul were martyred. We believe that the book of Hebrews was written shortly before the fall of Jerusalem. The temple was still standing. They're still practicing their Judaic principles. Next power slide I have here is I don't get it. The day that Jesus died in AD 30, Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to the bottom. Way back in AD 30, what was God trying to tell the nation of Israel? The final, the final lamb is sacrificed for you. Do not repeat this. Do not bring more lambs. He is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But what does religious man do? What did they do? Did he call up Amazon and order a new curtain? <laughs> I don't know. I, I just what I think he did. He probably went to the mission, Women's Missionary Society and put the curtain down and had them sew it. <laughs> Religious people like to do things. I can picture these men just sewing it. Just like our first parents. When they sin, they try to make their own fig leaves. It, it doesn't change. Not God's way. I'll, we'll just sew up this hole and continue with our Judaism. Then what happened 40 years later? What is God trying to tell us? Build down. Jesus said this when they were bragging on the temple that one day about, the, see this great temple? And Jesus said there'll be not left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. I mean, when Titus came in there and cleaned house in Jerusalem and knocked this temple down and burned it, they said they confiscated the booty and the gold. And even Josephus says that there was so much gold in this area that even the next country called Syria it devalued the price of gold 50% because so much gold went back into circulation. Jesus predicted it. What was, I think there's a greater message here. Judaism is done. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Amen. Here's a depiction of one of the gates in, in the city of Rome showing that Titus is bringing all the booty back into Jerusalem. So if Indiana Jones is out there looking for some of the stuff, Maybe want to try the bottom of the Tiber River. I don't know. <laughs> Jesus Christ is the Old Testament. I mean, Old Testament priest. We have this comparison. Why? I have three things quickly. The Old Testament priests were very flawed. That was in our text. They were flawed. They were finite. And it was a family. One. <laughs> and it's sad that this whole system, if you understand how flawed they were, the day that Moses and Aaron inaugurated the system. What happened to Aaron's first two sons? Do you know that little bit of history? The very first day that they inaugurated this temple, this tabernacle, Aaron's two sons got knocked off, killed. Some of you seem like, you know, what? 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 Let me just read to you Leviticus chapter 10, just a little bit of this. Just to show you how flawed our, our priests were in the Old Testament. Just Leviticus chapter 10. It says here in verse 1, Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took censers and put fire in it, and laid incense on it, and offered unauthorized or strange fire before the things that God did not commend, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has said. Can't you just see Moses' frustration? Aaron, we've got to go by the book. God's way, not our ways. 
no in inventions of her own. Otherwise, it's going to be repeated again. Our priests are going to die. And so they take out the two bodies, and then Aaron happens to have two more sons that take over. What a story. And later on in the church, in this history of the Jews, Eli had two sons that were terrible. Hophni and Phinehas. They were, they were immoral, and they were, they were very selfish in their share of the offerings. Eventually, they died in a battle with the Philistines. I mean, flawed, flawed, and finite. They had a beginning, and they died. Beginning, and they died. Christ's priesthood was what? Perfect. It was permanent. Uh, uh, let's, let's look at Hebrews 7.25. How, how perfect was this? Hebrews 7.25, I'm going to read that to you. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. I was washing my hands at Hormel Foods and Mike Dealer can say the same thing. We wash all the time. <laughs> Every time I go to the bathroom, i got to wash my hands all over. <laughs> Up in the bathroom and on the floor. Twice, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have wrinkled hands. I do. <laughs> and I was standing there and there was a guy next to me. He was washing his hands and his shirt was pulled up and I saw a tattoo. And I said, oh, what's that tattoo? It's praying hands. I said, oh, are you a Christian? He said, no, I'm a Buddhist. I said, oh. I said, I'm a Christian. I said, do you know that our Savior came in this world and he died for our sins and he's not dead? He rose again. Buddha has a grave, I said. Buddha has a grave. He, said, he had to agree with me. He had to agree with me. And then he wanted to talk because I know some of these Burmese people, a lot of them are Christians, thanks to Adam Iron Judson, who went there years ago and planted the Word of God in Burma. They want to know about the rapture, because some of his Burmese believers are telling him about Jesus is coming back. And he is. Praise the Lord. Buddha is in the grave, but our, it says here once again, he holds the priesthood permanently. He continues forever. Consequently, he's able to save to the uttermost who draw near to God since he always lives, always lives to make intercession for them. Yes, let's go to the next one. Jesus Christ is the perfect priest and the perfect sacrifice. He did this once for all when he offered himself. How can a priest become the victim? Jesus did. Priests had to, when they sacrificed in the Old Testament, before they can represent the people, they had to what? They had to do the sacrifice for themselves and their family. And then they came to represent the nation. Jesus Christ was sinless, perfect, unstained, spotless, Lamb of God. He didn't, no problem. He was the high priest that we need. But high priest became the, his own sacrifice. Some people say the best way to explain this is look at the seven sayings of Christ on the cross. Number one. What was the first thing he said? Father, what? Forgive them. There he's acting like a priest. But they don't know what they do. That's our greatest need, is to know that we are forgiven people. Amen. Then he looked at his mother. And he made an arrangement. It's so funny that he didn't go to his own immediate family. He wanted his mother to be with those that love the word of God. He connected mom with a real hungry guy for the word, John. They became best buds. He's acting like a priest. He looked at the thief on the cross. He says, we deserve this condemnation. That thief was just railing on him, but the other thief had a broken heart. He said, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And Jesus said, today, today, before the sun sets. A guy came up to me at work two, two weeks ago, and he said, what happens to people when they die? Is there purgatory? I said, there's no holding tank. It's either heaven or hell. Immediately absent from the body will be present with the Lord if you're a believer. He wanted to know if there's an intermediate state. There is none. Jesus said to the thief on the cross that repented, Today, before the sun sets, you will be with me in paradise. He's acting like a priest. But then, three or four, 12 to 3, he's acting like the lamb. He cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I thirst. I'm glad he thirsted because I don't have to be like the rich man that said, Send Lazarus over here because I'm thirsting in this flame. 
I don't have to say that. Because he took my hell on the cross. Right. He did. And then he said, it is finished. Acting like a lamb into thy hands. He could have hung there all day being God. He could have fought death. But he had to pay the wages of sin. And the wages of sin said is what? Is death. He had to pay the ultimate price for my sin. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. He became sin for us who knew no sin. Everything in the tabernacle represents Jesus Christ. Albert Lee had a replica about five years ago. How many people went to Albert Lee to walk through that? Okay, Troy, Wayne Worth, Karen. They go around the country and they set up a replica of the Old Testament tabernacle. It was beautifully done. It really was. And they had these little informational telephones to give you an update. What's happening in this spot? As I walked in there, I, all I saw was Jesus Christ the whole way through. I saw the door. Why not have a door to make it convenient for all the 12 tribes? One on that side of the tabernacle, one over here, one over here, and one for, this, It's a rectangle. Why not make it easy on the Israelites? One door. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. We go through one door to find Christ. And it's Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I come to the brazen altar. I thought of, what would I, I'd probably be bringing lambs in here all the time because <laughs> I sin, thought, word, or deed. I said, I, I, I would be so poor, I'd have to bring in the flour, or whatever they were except. But they brought in the lambs, and they had these little corner things called horns. When you had to wait your turn, and so these little lambs would be playful, so I can imagine all the, all the ropes would be tethered to the horns of the altar. But it says in Romans, as a Christian, I need to come what? I need to present my body to you a living Holy. I'm supposed to come to God voluntarily. Right. Not tethered. Say, God, okay, I'll serve you. <laughs> no, I come to God as a willing. And God wants to use me. Then it comes to that great water thing called the labor. The washing of water after the, after the, the sacrifice. And the washing their hands. The priests would look into this to see themselves in the spots. God word does, God's word does that. He's our labor. It was interesting. But why the sacrifice? Where did it when our first parents sinned, it started in the Garden of Eden, and it culminated with Calvary. Those that were truly saved in the Old Testament always brought blood. Unbelievers didn't do that. What, what did God teach Adam and Eve? Four lessons quickly. Sinners need to be covered. Number two, it cannot be humanly manufactured. Absolutely not. Number three, it's going to cost an innocent life and bloodshed someday. And number four, God's going to provide it, not you. Right. What happened to Cain? God, the parents were supposed to teach their children. Abel listened. He brought the blood. He acknowledged the sin of his life. And he was justified. Cain came to God and says, look at this beautiful garnished altar. I got the best wood of Vegas, tomatoes, cucumbers, leeks, garlics, you name it, it's here. And I got it garnished with all the what? All the flowers that God made. I'm sure that first century soil could produce a lot. But God was not pleased. He gave Cain a second chance. Cain, if you listen, I'm giving you a second chance. He did not. And what did he do? Out of jealousy, he killed his brother. And that is the history of religion versus salvation. It's either divine accomplishment or what? Human achievement. What are you trusting today? One of the stories that has mean a lot to me as a child growing up is this story here. God used a Sunday school teacher in flannel graph, sorry, to sh share the story with her class. She probably didn't know that one of the students in that class was really under conviction. Because I felt like that pilgrim, he's leaving this city. He has a burden on his back. It's called sin and guilt. And what do you do with it? How do you get rid of that guilt? And of course, on the pathway to Christ, he even left his family. He was so desperate. He says, I gotta get this thing settled in his life. How do I get rid of my sin and guilt? Well, on the pathway, he met some good people that try to tell him the right way. And isn't that true of life? That God will have his people out there to share. But he met this one guy called Mr. Worldly Wiseman. He said, oh, oh, I know how to get rid of that burden on your back. I know how. You go to such and such a city called morality. 
and you'll find a guy named Mr. Legality in the city of morality. And he'll tell you how to get rid of the burden. Oh, okay, I will, I will. And so Pilgrim takes off, and the road gets harder and harder and harder. And the fire shoots out of that hill. And, and, and he's scared, and he, and he backs up, and he runs away. And he runs into a person at the right time. I think Mr. Interpreter said, hey, come to my house. What you're trying to do is trying to forge your way to heaven by your own good works, keeping the law, and that doesn't work. He said, come in my back. I got a back room here. Pilgrim, see that room? Take that room. It starts. It's a dirt floor. Let's sweep it. And dust was filling up the whole room. He couldn't breathe. <coughs> and he ran out of the room and says, now let me tell you the lesson behind that, sweeping that dirty floor. The purpose of the law is to show you that you are guilty. You cannot keep the law. It shows you your lost condition. There's something else you need. Perhaps I go to the doctor and he detects a heart murmur with his stethoscope. No, he says, Mark, I, I, you got a problem. Here's the remedy. Now swallow the stethoscope. The stethoscope just revealed to me my problem. The law of God reveals to me my lost condition that I need a Savior, Jesus Christ. For by the law, it says in Romans 3, is the knowledge of sin. But only Christ can give me justification. And so Pilgrim got set back on the right road, and he came to the cross. And that is where, that is where it rolled away. Praise God. Back at your bulletins, please. There's an old poem. It's just... Let's say, let's say it together, the back of your bulletins, Jesus paid it all. And I'll close and have Pastor come up here and close in prayer. I guess there's a song yet. Let's, sing it, let's say it together. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thy all in all. Lord, now indeed I find thy power. And thine alone can change the leopard spots and melt the heart of stone. For nothing good have I whereby thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's land. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it by the sin. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Let me ask you, has your sin been washed away? Do you know for sure that Christ is your Savior? Or are you leaning on the works of the law? I'm going to pray, and as I pray, just take this time to contemplate what you have heard today. And if God's convicted you, let me encourage you to talk to either Mark or myself afterward. And we'd love to show you, as he's pointed out, salvation is by Christ. It's by faith in Christ alone. It's not by anything we do, but because of Christ. Let's pray.